This is a brief overview of the War of 1812, how the U.S. got involved, what happened during the war, and the major effects. So we last left off talking about Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson uh, was president for two terms, but he will follow Washington's precedent and retire after two terms. His uh, successor will be James Madison, who is elected with the support of Jefferson. He's a Democratic Republican, following in Jefferson's footsteps, and he will win the election. Madison will have to come in and deal with a lot of the problems that Jefferson was dealing with, particularly the problems with Europe. Under Madison, Congress will replace the Non-Intercourse Act, if you remember that prohibited trade with Britain and France. They will replace that with Macon's Bill Number 2. This reopens trade with Britain or France once one of the other countries <laughs> promises to respect U.S. neutrality. America would then ban trade with the other. Napoleon in France will take advantage of this deal. He says, I will respect U.S. neutrality. In exchange, right, then the U.S. will stop trading with Britain. Madison will fall for it, put an embargo on Britain, but does Napoleon listen and do what he said? No, it was a trick, and he keeps seizing American ships. The U.S. will leave its embargo on Britain in place. This is really the end of U.S. neutrality, and it looks like we are heading to war. There were other factors that led to the War of 1812 besides just the economic things. We have the election of new congressmen. These are known as war hawks, and war hawks are Democratic Republicans from the South and West, and they get their name Warhawks because they were pro-war with Britain. They're against uh, both the British and Native Americans. A lot of the Warhawks are from the South and West, so they deal with conflict of the Native Americans, who is arming the Native Americans, but Great Britain. The big leaders of Warhawks will be Henry Clay and John Calhoun, and these groups really are going to push a pro-war with Britain agenda. Henry Clay will be Speaker of the House, and he'll have a lot of power to do that. So they win in a sweeping election in 1810, giving them lots of power uh, for their agenda. Other things that lead to it are, again, conflicts with Native Americans. Um, we have the two Shawnee brothers, one named Tecumseh and his brother, who gets called by Americans, the Prophet. They are going to try and unite settlers against, or unite Native Americans against white settlers. Uh, Tecumseh will emphasize, you can see passages from him, he'll emphasize uh, cultural roots of Native Americans, avoiding things of uh, white culture, and trying to unite together to challenge that. There's the famous battle, uh, William Henry Harrison, who is governor of the Indiana Territory, later future president, we'll get to him, will uh, lead the um, colonists, or sorry, Americans, into battle against the Shawnees at, famously, the Battle of Tippy Canoe. Harrison will destroy the Shawnee headquarters. It'll really end that United Native movement. It pushes Harrison to be a national hero, and we'll come back to that for his uh, election. The other thing Battle of Tippy Canoe and other conflicts with natives reveal is that who is helping the Native Americans but the British. In particular, the British are providing the natives with weapons, limited support, and that will further anger the U.S., particularly war hawks, who see that Britain is now really getting involved in all of our business. They're not just attacking our ships at sea. They are now also um, helping Native Americans fight us in the West. So we're really getting towards war. Um, big causes of war, just to recap, we have impressment of U.S. citizens. Remember, that still hasn't stopped on the seas. 
interference with American shipping, trying to restrict it with orders of counsel, trying to limit it, attacking American ships. And then now we have the British supporting Native American resistance. So Warhawks and a lot of Americans will really push for war with Britain, thinking this is the only way that we can deal with them. Uh, there's also this idea that perhaps we could restore faith in America, give America more credibility as a nation if we um, push for war and win. The public view of the war, the vote of the war is close in Congress. Um, support for the war is mostly from the West and South. We will know that the Federalists are super against the war. Their stronghold will be in New England kind of interesting because New England has a lot of trade and shipping that this was affecting, but they will be against the war. But going into the war, it's kind of a mixed view from the American public. The War of 1812, again, you do not need to know a lot of details about the war. You don't need to know a ton about specific battles, troop movements, anything like that. But I'm just going to go over an overview of major events and highlights from the war. So is the U.S. military ready for war? Absolutely not. The U.S. is weak, well-trained. Remember, Jefferson had actually weakened the military. Um, they have some terrible plan for a three-pronged approach that would involve them attacking various cities, but small areas in Canada, um, instead of just taking, like, Montreal or something. The uh, fighting, it's going to be tough fighting. Remember, Britain has the most powerful navy, so the U.S. tries to fight a lot on land um, to deal with um, Britain. Um, the U.S. is really beaten early on in the war, and they'll look for success at sea. At sea, again, we have kind of a disadvantage, right? We've got a really small navy. But there's a lot of motive to fight, kind of giving them more morale. You need to know, um, I don't know how much you need to know, but the Constitution is a U.S. ship that um, will have iron on it to help try and defeat the British in battle. There'll be a lot of uh, fighting because, remember, Britain controls Canada. So there's a lot of fighting in Canada and particularly between the U.S., and Canada territories on the Great Lakes. Um, so you'll see uh, Oliver Perry win victories on the Great Lakes uh, at sea. But the British will mostly blockade U.S. ships and they'll do it pretty well, leaving that by like 1813, U.S. ships really aren't going anywhere and that war is not being fought. The fighting on land as time goes on the British will have a plan to attack a lot of U.S. coastal towns. They will famously burn uh, the capital, Washington, D.C., forcing President Madison to flee. And then we get to our famous battle of Fort McHenry up near Baltimore. The British try and take the fort. They can't take the fort, leading to Francis Scott Key writing the famous Star Spangled Banner a poem about seeing that the U.S. flag is still there during the fighting. Andrew Jackson is actually a big uh, victor in the War of 1812. He'll lead a lot of fighting in the South. Um, he'll fight a lot of Native Americans during the War of 1812. Most Native American tribes will side with the British, and so Jackson will lead um, U.S. troops against them in the South and West. Two big battles for Andrew Jackson are going to be the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which will be a big victory for the U.S., defeating the Creek tribe. And then Andrew Jackson's greatest victory actually comes after the war is over. It's a huge victory for him, although not relevant to the war. The peace treaty has already been signed, but they didn't get the memo. And that's the Battle of New Orleans. And at the Battle of New Orleans, that picture in the bottom corner um, depicts it. It's a huge victory and um, particularly a boost to nationalism. The war will end with the Treaty of Ghent. The Treaty of Ghent is signed in Ghent, Belgium. Basically both sides are really tired of the war. The U.S. is worried that it might not actually win 
and so they decide to meet in Ghent, Belgium. There's less reason to fight for Britain. They've defeated Napoleon, and they kind of want to get back to uh, focusing on Europe. So we get this idea for an end to the fighting. The Treaty of Ghent will end the fighting with an armistice, um, ending the War of 1812, although we know some fighting still continues on, like the Battle of New Orleans. And the weird thing about the Treaty of Ghent is they just fought a war for two years, right? We're in 1814, and the war resolves nothing. Super weird, but they restore the conquered territories and they go back to pre-war boundaries. So any land either side gained is not, does not count, and they go back to exactly the way things were before the war. Additionally, the Britain does not promise to stop impressment. Britain does not promise to respect U.S. neutrality or trade rights. There's very little change. It's basically a tie, and not much really results from the war. That's on a relationship between Britain and the U.S. However, for the U.S., there are big changes, and one of those comes from the Hartford Convention. The Hartford Convention is a meeting in New England, where New England states meet near the end of the war, so this is actually before the treaty's been signed, to try and discuss their grievances. There's some talk of secession, but not really. They're not talking about seceding, but they are really upset about some major problems. They want to limit the power of the West and South, which they see as a threat to them. Remember, that's becoming more powerful now. Additionally, um, they're upset about, you know, so many presidents being from Virginia. They feel like the New England isn't really being represented. They're all Federalists, mostly, at the Hartford Convention. And unfortunately for them, they bring down their list of grievances, but the war has already ended. And so the war really ends before they can throw a fit or get anything they want. The Hartford Convention is significant because it's considered the beginning of the end of the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party will try and hang in there a little bit, but this is really a sign that they are not on the same page as the rest of the country, and they're not really understanding um, how things are changing. Big effects of the war. This is probably most important about the War of 1812 is the effects it has. It changes the nation. One, it's often considered America's second war for independence, giving them the respect of other nations, right? That first victory wasn't a fluke, and although, you know, you could debate how victorious we were in the War of 1812, right? It wasn't a total loss, and so it's the respect from other nations, more legitimacy. Additionally, um, it is the end of the Federalist Party, right? We'll see the Federalist Party decline, leading us to a one-party system, which we'll be talking about more in the era of good feeling. The War of 1812 is bad news for Native Americans. They will continue to just give up more and more land, be moved further and further west, which we'll be talking about a, a large part of the rest of the year, but particularly coming up with Andrew Jackson. The war did increase U.S. industry, right? The U.S. was fighting Britain, so they had to provide a lot of industrial materials. So we've got baby U.S. industry growing up a little, and we'll talk more about how that's benefited um, in the era of good feeling. New war heroes, particularly William Henry Harrison and Andrew Jackson, leading to future politicians. But the biggest effect of the War of 1812 is nationalism. The U.S. now feels like they've got pride in their country, they've got power, there's this idea that U.S. future lays in the West, forget about Europe and those other countries, we can focus on ourselves and become even more um, powerful. And that'll lead us into the era of good feeling and changes like that, which we'll be talking about next time.